Ahmed has passed the country's largest budget ever. The government will spend about $936 billion during the new fiscal year starting in April. The budget bill cleared the upper house on Thursday. The ruling Liberal Democratic Party and its coalition partner, New Kometo Party, hold a majority in the chamber. It's the first time in three years that the government has succeeded in getting a budget through the diet before the start of the new fiscal year. The Abe government hopes to smoothly enact this budget. The aims are to minimize any downside effect on the economy from the consumption tax hike and to pull the country out of deflation. Let's take a look at the budget breakdown for spending. Nearly $300 billion is allotted for Social Security, including medical services, pensions and welfare. As Japan's population ages, spending continues to expand. In the special account, a total of about $35.6 billion is set aside for restoration projects related to the 2011 natural disaster in northeastern Japan. Of that, more than $8.4 billion is to be used for restoring and building infrastructure. This will be on roads and for facilities along rivers and coasts in the disaster-hit region. And more than $1 billion is budgeted as subsidies for speeding up revival of Fukushima. This will be to help those who evacuated after the 2011 nuclear accident to return to their hometowns. As for funding sources, tax revenues are expected to increase due to the consumption tax hike next month. And the issuance of government bonds will decline from the current fiscal year. But state bonds will account for 43 percent of the total revenues, showing that the country's finances continue to largely depend on government debt. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company have been told to place greater priority on the crisis at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The request came in a briefing with commissioners from Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority. They say TEPCO officials should focus more on decommissioning the reactors and dealing with radioactive water. More than 100 tons of contaminated water has recently leaked from one of the storage tanks. A malfunction in the water filtering system caused highly radioactive water to flow into treated water tanks. In the meeting, NRA Commissioner Toyoshi Fukeda said the troubles could have been prevented. He also said TEPCO should be spending more money on safety measures at the plant. NRA Chairman Shinichi Tanaka said TEPCO should improve working conditions to ensure the safety of the more than 4,000 workers at the plant and to maintain their morale. After the briefing, the president of TEPCO told reporters he has not been trying to save money, but that he sincerely accepts the instruction. As pointed out in the meeting, there are things we should have realized earlier and acted on. As an organization, we are deeply sorry for that. He said that he will work hard as the top executive to restart the malfunctioning water treatment system and reduce the amount of tainted water. Negotiators from six world powers and Iran have locked horns again over the Iranian nuclear program. They met over two days in Vienna, but they're divided on some issues. The major powers want the Iranians to scale back their uranium enrichment program, and they fear the Iranians could use a heavy water reactor that's under construction to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. We had very useful and serious talks about a variety of issues. We spoke about uranium enrichment, the Arak reactor, peaceful nuclear cooperation, and sanctions. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif and his colleagues are facing increasing pressure from hardliners at home. They don't want to bow to any pressure from the West. Most members of the U.S. Congress are nervous, too. They sent President Barack Obama letters earlier this week urging caution in dealings with Iran. The negotiators will meet again next month. The showdown is brewing between Washington State and the federal government over plans to clean up nuclear waste at Hanford. The federal energy secretary came to Olympia to share a new draft plan for the project, and when he left, Governor Inslee could not contain his disappointment. Environmental specialist Gary Chittum joins us live from Olympia, where the governor just put the Department of Energy on notice. Gary?
That's right, Meg. Legal notice. He and his attorney general are getting together to look at their options for possibly taking the Department of Energy to court. This after a meeting with U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz and the governor in here today ended poorly. The governor did not get what he wanted. We are entitled to an enforceable agreement uh, contractually and legally, and we intend to insist on that on behalf of Washingtonians to get this waste out of the state of Washington. The tone of that meeting could be seen on the faces of those leaving it today. Governor Inslee had demanded a comprehensive plan to clean up Hanford. He didn't get it. We do not have a, a, a set plan. I, I think we're going to have some, uh, some action in this regard in the next several weeks. Inslee is unhappy with the pace of the Hanford cleanup, where promises are made, but deadlines rarely are. 60 million gallons of the deadliest leftovers from the U.S. nuclear weapons program are simmering in underground tanks never designed to hold out this long. The treatment plant, expected to be up and running, processing that waste into easier-to-handle glass, is years behind schedule and currently stalled due to design problems. The waste has burned holes in older tanks and is eating its way through even one of the newer double-walled tanks. The older tanks are being drained, but the Department of Energy is running out of room to safely store it. Billions are spent each year, and while removal of the lower-level waste and structures has advanced well, the remaining nuclear waste makes Hanford the nation's largest and most dangerous waste site. We uh, intend to get to an enforceable uh, standard and agreement with the department, and if we don't, we'll take other action. And that other action could include anything from some arbitration to going to the courtroom. Also, right after that meeting today, the state attorney general issued a statement saying he's directed his staff to come up with a list of legal options the governor can use to strengthen those negotiations. Reporting live in Olympia, Gary Chittam, King 5 News. But Gary, don't we already have agreements? We do. We have two very powerful agreements, but they don't have the kind of language in it that the governor wants. He wants to be able to say the next time the Department of Energy says we're going to miss a deadline because of unforeseen circumstances, the governor's going to say no. It says right here you're going to have this completed on this date, and we will hold it. On this show, I like to feature grassroots activists and artists that have politically or socially conscious messages to bring to the table. A lot of these voices you'll never hear on TV because radical thought is marginalized in the mainstream. Which brings me to Jamie Dunmore. He's a young spoken word poet from England whose viral online poetry videos caught my eye. His poem, My Call for Humanity, invokes a call to action for people everywhere to tap in to what it means to be human. I like the content of the piece so much that I asked Jamie to come on and perform it for you. So here I am, standing alone in the open. I'm here with a message, hoping to repair what's broken. Nature is struggling, humanity's not on track. We've got our heads in the sand and our pride intact. We seek fulfillment through wealth, but do we achieve it? We want prosperity through consumerism, but is it worth it? Have we actually found freedom or have we lost it? Because all we do is follow a system and never really challenge it. Can you relate to that? Or is the world too blind to see? I'd always seek the truth, but care what my peers thought of me. I saw a different perspective and struggled by the hour. See, I knew ignorance was bliss, but knowledge could give me power. So now I call for humanity, not just for one nation. I'm opposing separation and standing up to segregation. Whether religious or atheist, in essence we're the same. Stereotypes are man-made, and it was man who created the game. But are we actually ready to accept this and wake up? Can we put our naivety on the line, or are we always going to collide? Are we ready to make a difference? Do we venture into the unknown, or do we stay in our comfort zones and keep on taking the easy ride? Because at sea, it's ships that are safest at shore. But no, that's not what ships were made for. So ask yourself this, why are you really here? You may find that deep, but my question really is sincere. For my generation, are we misled as a youth? Do we rub off our true purpose due to false misleading truth? Are we prone to propaganda? Are we prone to wrong information? Are we taught to judge each other based on religion, sex, race, culture, class, nation? The list goes on. So it's time to start improving and it's time to start speaking because resources are lowering and poverty is increasing. We allow cities to get larger, buildings to get taller, but trees to get shorter and forests to get smaller. 
We're an ingenious species. We could easily change everything, but we're made to think different due to decades of conditioning. We conform to education to confirm our insecurity, yet it's a biased institution that makes wisdom hold obscurity. Is it actually correct? And does it actually judge intelligence? Or is it just listening to our elders and improving our obedience? A possession's an illusion of worth. Are we tricked in our thinking? Are we trying to buy wholeness and are we trying to buy meaning? Do they always give joy? Do they distract us from reality? Do they determine our identity and do they alter our morality? I mean, what are our goals? This really isn't a joke. Can happiness be superficial and our routine a hoax? Do we live for the wrong things whilst the right things choke? Is mainstream TV legit or can it dictate our attractions? Does it actually bring us together or does it separate us into factions? We categorize each other via a social hierarchy, but status is made by humans. So who really are we? Is ego destroying eco? Are the real problems disguised? Do we really know the truth or does our society feed us lies? Are we actually filling our voids? And does money hold any true weight? Could we drop our precious comforts to renew our planet's state? It really is time to stop living our lives in shells because doing nothing for others is the undoing of ourselves. We're all from the same source, so let's see it for what it's worth. We only have one home, and that home is planet Earth. In your poetry, you talk about needing to seek out information in a world, kind of a web of lies. Was there a particular moment for you when you realized that the government and media were lying to us? Um, I guess there was no specific time in my life that really made me question things. It, it kind of happened over a long period of time. But, um, it was mainly when I was in education in school I started questioning um, authoritative figures such as, you know, um, tutors and teachers and stuff like that and really questioning where they got their motives from and how they were teaching us. And I don't know, I guess that led me onto a lot of introspection in a sense then and that's what really made me question entirely um, what goes on in this world and mainly just what we've been fed, you know, because I feel like the government and the media portrays this false sense of reality in a lot of ways. Uh, and there's a theme also that calls into question kind of consumerism, and you're yeah. kind of urging people, can we ever come away from consumerism? Why do you feel passionately about the need to do that? Um, I believe consumerism is, I, I believe it's okay as long as you don't take it as a priority, you know. I believe materialism is okay as long as it's not a priority, and I think the problem with consumerism is that it kind of makes us forget that we're human beings most of the time. We start of like gives us labels and false identities that takes us away from our true nature. And that's, I guess, that's what I'm really trying to challenge and make people go back to their authenticity, their, sim their simplicity, rather than focusing on materialism. You know, and things aren't necessarily natural from a human perspective. Um, you know, you're from the UK, a close US ally to our war machine, <laughs> kind of yeah. partners in crime there. Um, what, how do you feel about that partnership and kind of this overly militarized union of all these Western powers? Um, well, you know, I like to see the world from an Earth perspective as if I'm an alien, you know? Like, I don't like mm. to see it as if I'm um, a human being living in a certain country. I like to see everybody in the human race as my family rather than um, saying that, you know, British citizens are my allies, Americans are my allies, you know? I see everyone in humanity as my family. Um, I don't believe that... Uh, Western countries actually have any authority over like Middle Eastern countries. I believe we're all equal. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And like, I always come to the question, you know, why was I born a British citizen? I had, I had no choice to be born British. I had no choice to be born this allied Western person. So it's all luck. So when I know that, I have to, I question um, Middle Eastern people. And I, I always believe that they're the same as me. So what difference really is there? I couldn't agree more. Borders are meaningless. Yeah, I, borders are man-made. Everything's man-made. These borders that we, you know, we invent these divisions between us to really separate ourselves and the hubris that people have to think that we can go and invade other countries and tell them what's best for them. Yeah, really, you know, yeah, what's nobody best for owns. us. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, you, you know, you perform the poem "My Call for Humanity." Yeah. What would you say? I guess if you could summarize, what is that call? Um, to wake up. Yeah. Yeah, to see life from another perspective, I guess, you know. It's okay to question things. It's okay to see life from another perspective and not the perspective that mainstream TV feeds down to us, you know. There's a lot more to life than what we're told. And I guess I just really want people to see that because it's opened a lot of things up for me and it's really made me, like, appreciate life in a lot more ways, you know. I appreciate nature much more. 
I'm not so stressed all the time. I see life for what it is, and that's that was the main call. You know, I want people to work together and realize that we're a team. Humanity is a team. There's no borders. There's no different nations. At the end of the day, they're all artificial constructs that we've made. Thank you, you know? so much coming on, sharing that. Where Thanks can people find out more about your work, Jamie? Uh, you can search me on Twitter at Jamie Dunmore. And you can search me on YouTube, Jamie Dunmore, Michael for Humanity, Why I Hate Society, Beloved Humanity. Thank you so much for coming on and making you, the Abby. trip.